thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute joy to talk to you this afternoon about primary science. That is what I do. And I'm going to talk particularly about some work I've been doing this year with HarperCollins uh, on, our, on the SNAP science resource. So just to introduce myself, um, I'm just by sort of sh showing you what I've been doing recently, because this is going to inform what I talk about. So my, um, as as Beth and said, I, I'm the director of something called the Primary Science Quality Mark, which some of you may know about. We have had schools in Dubai achieve primary science quality marks and, um, and in other parts of the UAE. So um, the Primary Science Quality Mark is a year long CPD program that schools take part in to develop the quality and uh, a standard of their subject leadership in science and then improve the teaching and learning that goes on. And so um, that's, we work with about 600 schools a year, mainly in, in England and the rest of the UK, but also um, internationally as well. So that is my main role, which is working with all of those schools every year and the people who, who support them. As Bethan said, I've just stepped down from being chair of the Association for Science Education. The ASE is the biggest subject organisation in the UK. And if I really heartily recommend you join for £45. We join as an individual member of the ASC and then access all of the resources that are on the website and become part of this big membership group advocating for primary science and also supporting each other within it. So I can't recommend the ASC highly enough. On the left hand side there, you can see something called the Framework for a Future Primary Science Curriculum. This is a piece of work that really informs the way I'm thinking at the moment, which has been um, I was uh, challenged by the Learned Society, so the Institute for Physics, the Royal Society of Biology, the Royal Society of Chemistry and the ASE to lead a small group to think about what a, a future primary science curriculum could look like. And that's been really helpful for me because obviously I'm quite embedded in the English national curriculum is probably the one I know best. But actually that gave me the chance to look more openly about what primary science curriculum could be like and should be like in terms of the world our, the children we're educating are part of and are, will be um, become adults in and all the challenges that are presented to them. So it's been a really interesting activity and it's helped me to recognise how we can bring some of those important elements for children's futures into the current curriculum we're working with. And as um, Bethan said, I'm based at the University of Hertfordshire here in the southeast of England, where I have a role also um, teaching occasionally, not every every week, but I am involved in teaching uh, trainee teachers as well, which is a really always a very enjoyable activity. But the thing that has really taken over my life, I would say, for the last year or so has been Snap Science. So I'm a serious editor of Snap Science, which is Collins Resource to support teaching of primary science. And I very, um, probably a bit naively took on that role in 2014 when the English National Curriculum was revised and we had the new curriculum about to launch into schools. And Collins came to me and said, we want to produce some support for teachers. Would you help us do that? And I probably a little naively said yes. And it became a massive project and we produced a large number of, um, we produced six years worth of work for, and then foundation stage came later for teachers. So a, a very, very big resource for teachers to use to teach science, lots and lots of lessons and lots of supporting materials. And it was, it's been great and it's been very well received, but obviously in the, in the nine years since that was published, quite a lot has happened. This, we've learned a lot, there's been great research work gone on. There's been a lot of practitioner activity where we could actually identify what was really working and what could perhaps be done better. So I was absolutely thrilled when Collins came back to me last year and said, we think it's time now for a second edition. So the last year has been spent looking at SNAP, seeing what was really good in it, seeing what could be improved, seeing what we didn't need and uh, slimming it down and producing um a resource that's now really, really fit for 2023 onwards. And I'm absolutely thrilled with it. I couldn't be more delighted with um, the outcome we've got. I think this is, it's a it's a really great resource now. So um, this is, um, that's, that's sort of shaped me the last year or so. 
And I want to talk for the first few minutes of this presentation about the sort of external factors that have been shaping um, primary science practice within the UK. Now, I know that you're all teaching overseas, but I've, the things I've chosen to have to, to, that we've used very much as our influence to shape SNAP second edition, I think are relevant wherever you're teaching. This is about good practice, best practice in primary science. What is it that it makes primary science teaching really, really strong and effective? So these are some of the things that have really influenced my thinking in this and that have shaped SNAP second edition. So one of the interesting things that's happened in the UK is that primary science went off out of focus a bit. We had uh, quite a rigorous accountability um, structure, so where science was being tested and by external tests every year for our 11 year old children. And that that, that test was removed in 2009 because um, for various reasons, all good reasons actually, that, that the sort of testing that could be done at that scale wasn't really indicative of it, it didn't tell us much about what children could do um, and it didn't and actually because the teaching became skewed to the test a little it ended up actually not being a helpful teaching tool and quite a lot of negativity was around that so it was removed but then of course teachers well not teachers but uh, the people who look at what's going on in schools thought it mattered less or science was less important so we had we, we lost the focus on science in primary schools. And um, of course, by the time the inspectorate realized this, we've been telling them for quite a long time, um, they then wrote a report to say that we are concerned about, um, in some schools, the amount of science that's being taught, and we're being we're concerned about the thinking that's going into it, the planning for, for teaching really effectively. So that was quite helpful in 2020 to see that because it was something that we were aware of and we wanted schools to respond to. So that was that came out from the inspectorate. Of course, shortly following that, we had a global pandemic and we know that this had an impact on children's learning in science. So we had we had um, the impact of just actually children being in school or not being in school, remote learning and the and the impact that had on on particularly on practical work. And we know that it impacted, that the disruption on science learning had an unequal impact on different groups of children. And those children who were already disadvantaged um, were impacted more by the impact of the, of the pandemic. It's sort of ironic, isn't it, that we had a, you know, when never was the world so engaged with science as it was during the pandemic, we were all following the science, listening to what scientists said they were on our televisions every day but actually what was going on in schools became an impoverished um an impoverished menu for, or diet of science so um welcome were really clear after they produced this report in 2021 about the impact of science that it's you know making really really clear statements it's vital that schools allocate enough opportunity for quality prim primary science teaching and learning as part of a rich curriculum Every school science curriculum must enable pupils to sort of build on their learning, to embed it securely, and that science leaders have to have regular time to lead and develop. And they're quite big asks on top of everything else that schools are being asked to do. And I'm really aware, as someone who, as a primary teacher, didn't have a hinterland of scientific qualifications. I learned my science as I taught it with, with young children in my class that actually we're requiring subject leaders to do something that I think is quite challenging to plan a quality primary science teaching and learning curriculum and to embed all of that through familiar context, less familiar context, it, it, it's a challenge. And so what we've done, what I've tried to do in, in all of my work is to give primary science subject leaders the support that they need so that they can then go and support their colleagues to teach science well. Other things that have really influenced me, Ofsted, the inspectorate in the UK, produced once they started, once they realised they needed to put some attention on science, they produced something called the Research Review, and they looked at um, recent research into assessment, pedagogy, curriculum, and they summarised that research in terms of what they understood from that was effective science teaching. 
the report is useful, but it's quite challenging. It's quite it's quite confusing. It sort of merges primary and secondary. Some of the language isn't helpful to primary teachers. Some of the examples aren't relevant. So a group of us from the ASC, from PSQM, the Quality Mark, and from Manchester University produced something called, that you can see there, a response to the Ofsted Research Review. I've put um, a QR code on there. If you follow that, you will be able to download that response. And we wrote that to give some just clear guidance to teachers about how to use the research review. And from within that, our very short document, um, we identified five emerging issues for primary science teachers. So these are issues that we think are of particular relevance uh, for primary science that were identified through that research review. And they are as follows, about subject leadership, about, um, about built children, building children's substantive and disciplinary knowledge. These were new terms for us in the UK, substantive and disciplinary knowledge. We weren't, we hadn't used them before. We used to talk about scientific concepts. We used to talk about working scientifically or scientific skills. But disciplinary knowledge, I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute, was clearly identified as something that we need to think of as a type of knowledge. Then improvement of, of children's learning being really led through a sequence progressive curriculum about using a purposeful, purposefully selecting the teaching approaches that are appropriate to the context and being confident to assess effectively. So those five issues have really influenced the way that we've taken SNAP science forward in this new edition. Following the Ofsted uh, uh, research review, they published a, um, a report about what they were seeing in schools and they used the research review as their lens to look at practice that was going on in primary schools in England. And again, they produced a report which held no surprises. It was, you know, once you, I'd read the research review and I knew what they were looking for, it was clear to me where they might find some gaps in, in practice. And so we wrote another response to this, which you can download from that QR code, to help teachers make sense of that report and be able to frame really good conversations in their schools about how to improve uh, the curriculum and the teaching and learning practice. And again, there were emerging issues from that. And here they were around professional learning and development. So very similar to in the previous report, connected curriculum, disciplinary knowledge, purposeful assessment and evidence-informed pedagogy. And those are the five areas I'm now going to talk about. And I'm going to give you a bit of a sort of explanation about how we've, in how we've really used them to inform uh, SNAP Science Second Edition. So the first one, I'm not actually going to start with the first one. I'm not going to start with professional learning and development. I'm going to start with number two, connected curriculum. So Ofsted gave us a really clear uh, a really clear steer, actually, that if we're thinking of our science curriculum, whatever whatever uh, sort of published uh, curriculum we're using, whether it's the national curriculum for our area, whether we've brought in a curriculum, so like Cambridge curriculum, as teachers, as science subject leaders, we need a really clear understanding about what science is. And sometimes I think as teachers, it's really easy to start at the point of going, what are we going to do? What's the bit I have to teach? What's the activity I, I'm going to do for that? And really, we need to start further back. At what's the big idea? What is science? What do we want children to learn? And then my next point would always be, what's it for? Why do we want children to learn science? What is it? What is our vision for the children in our school? What do they want? What do we want them to get out of the science we're teaching them? And I'm going to refer here to Dewey. If any of you are as old as me, you may have um, you may have come across Dewey before. He was a fantastic educator from the last century. Wrote extensively about education, and is always um, somewhat uh, it, it has informed the way I think about teaching all the way through my career. And he wrote that every experience is a moving force, and its value can be judged only on the ground of what it moves toward and unto. And I know sometimes in school, we're just moving towards the end of the day. Can we get that far? But we need to think about where is that experience that we're providing for these children? Where is it moving them to? What is its value? 
So if you keep that in your head as you think about a vision, then the first thing we did for SNAP was to think about what our vision was. What did we want um, it to achieve for those children, for the children we teach? So our vision is that all children make sustained progress in science so that it's it, that it's sustained it's regular that they securely learn new knowledge and skills and they connect these to their prior learning that they find things out through practical experimentation because science is a hard to practical subject really important that they build positive attitudes to science and they see the relevance of their learning to their lives now and how it can build a better future for everyone so really important that not only does science that they learn in schools helps them make sense of the world around them now it gives them agency to live better lives to live flourishing lives to look after our planet to actually address some of the issues that my generation is leaving behind will be leaving behind so it's really important that we have a really clear understanding about why we teach science in our school and as soon as you have that vision about what it's for then it helps you to shape everything that you do so that's our vision. That means that we need to connect our curriculum through the school. So, so I would talk about whole school planning involving all teachers in all year groups so that we're not working in, in, in silos, so that we're not all just doing our bit, but that we're working out and understanding how it all joins together so that children from across the school there is a very clear progression of how those ideas join up. We're really lucky in primary because we don't just have to sit in a biology a lab. We work in a classroom where we can integrate not just biology, physics and chemistry, because they do integrate and fit together, but we can integrate it with our history, with our language, with our literacy, with the mathematics, with the work we're doing in music, maybe. There's all sorts of opportunities for us to make those links. So linking across between subjects and then linking between topics in primary science, but also making sure that that planning makes sense so that we're not all trying to use the electricity kit at the same time. So that if we're going to be observing birds, it's the right time of year to observe those birds, that we're not going to be doing line graphs in maths if they haven't yet, uh, in science, if they haven't done them in maths yet. If we're working on life cycles, are we linking it to our personal and social education? So all of that coherence, is is really really important and i think quite challenging to plan when you're trying to plan all your other subjects as well so that's where we've been able to help you and i see what we've tried to be in snap is the farm manager we've tried to bring all that that together so the silos aren't separate but that everything is connected across the years and between the different parts of the curriculum and it looks like this then so this is our long term plan for it within snap We've taken the, U, the English national curriculum and we've divided it into six uh, modules per year. There's four in foundation, but there's six across every year, other year, to be taught roughly into a half, in a half term. And if you any of you are old SNAP users, you will know that there was some flexibility in this new version of SNAP that the, the modules need to be taught in the order that we have um, put them here because that's how the progression then clearly works and the progression within the conceptual knowledge but also in that disciplinary knowledge so because it's that understanding about how knowledge and skills progress it's absolutely key to this so we have followed guidance from Wynne Harland some of you may have read Wynne Harland's work in your training a very influential science educator who talked about a clear progression knowing what needs to be achieved at various points based on careful analysis of concepts and current research and understanding of how learning in science takes place and that's what we've done throughout SNAP. That was also reflected in something that the inspectorate said, the UK inspectorate about a high quality science curriculum prioritises people's building knowledge of key concepts in a meaningful way so actually that we're making sure that they're building on all the time and to do that one of the first things we've done in SNAP was to look at the different parts of the curriculum and really see how that progression works. So looking at what children learn in plants in year one, what the national curriculum and the English curriculum that we're working with requires them to learn, breaking each of the national curriculum statements down 
into smaller statements that can be very clearly taught and then building those up over the years and seeing how that progression works. So we've done this, we did this before we did anything else to really make sure that that progression was absolutely clear. And that underpins everything that we've done throughout SNAP. But of course, the coherence, as I was saying just now, isn't just to do with within that idea. So here we've got a big idea about plants growing, but it also works. We have to connect up between ideas, between different aspects of science. So this is a, a good example of that. This is uh, six lessons, five lessons in a module in year four, which is teaching that part of the English national curriculum, which is about the impact um, that humans can have on the environment. And so we've looked at that and uh, devised five lessons here to, to teach children, to, to build children's awareness of the, of the impact of behaviour and things we do on, on the environment. But we've built that up steadily. So we have to start out by understanding about what litter is. You know, this is the way we've done it here. This builds on the work that children have done in uh, infant school in year one and two about identifying, looking at uh, similarities and differences between materials, being able to sort materials into different types. But the big idea here is that some materials are biodegradable and some are not. Some can be recycled and some cannot. So all litter is not the same. And understanding that big idea that if litter isn't disposed of correctly, it becomes pollution. So then we need to have a bit more understanding about, well, do all materials, you know, which materials do biodegrade? So then we've done some work on that. Then what happens to these things that don't biodegrade? How do they, where do they go? So understanding how microplastics get into the food chain, which obviously links to understanding about why we put sewage sludge on, on uh, fields, about, you know, uh, about fertilizers, about uh, uh, conditions for plants growing, then we think more about the impact on our seas and oceans. So there's a progression there of big ideas through through that those five lessons, but there's also really clear links to other learning that children have done in other aspects of, of their science education. So that's what I mean by connected curriculum. Now, the other th one of the things I've mentioned is this substantive and disciplinary knowledge. So this has come through really uh, clearly in the Ofsted um, work. And I don't think we need to be nervous of this. I don't think it's something that as teachers we've not been using. We just haven't been using those terms. This is a summary we wrote in one of the guidance docs I, I gave you the links to. So the substantive knowledge is the science, what we call the science content, the, the what people's learn about the products of science or the knowledge correct produced by science. So that's your biology, chemistry, physics concepts. And then the disciplinary knowledge is, is, is what children learn about the ways of doing science and how scientists develop that scientific knowledge. So actually how they gather and analyze data, the different types of inquiry they use and how they, how they then, the skills they have to use to collect that inf information or collect that data. So what we've done in, science, in SNAP is respond to um, research that says children can't be expected to learn this disciplinary knowledge simply as a byproduct of taking part in practical activities. So we've been absolutely explicit here about how children gain that knowledge and we teach it very um, clearly. So sometimes there's an ex uh, there's a sort of explicit bit of teaching how to use a bit of uh, equipment, how to write a conclusion, how to draw a table, how to use a graph, um, how to evaluate an activity, how to look at data and consider its validity. But sometimes we integrate it, and as much as possible, we've integrated it in, but always being explicit about what's the disciplinary knowledge that's been learned. So for example, here, we have uh, an example from year two, where we've got in that materials module, there's a lesson where children learn about the properties of different fabrics and how that makes them suitable for a toddler's dungarees. So they're learning about durability, will they rip, are they comfortable for a child to wear, all of those things. But they do a comparative test to evaluate the material suitability. And they learn that this is how scientists work. They compare set, uh, different uh, materials 
they produce a set of criteria. But where in the classroom we do a rubber test by hand, we consider in the lesson why scientists would do this by machine. And we consider and 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 just said that we can understand how science works beyond the classroom. And obviously in that they have to complete a table of results. So we make sure they can do that. They also learn about how named scientists in the past and today have developed and tested new materials. So what we've got there is a properly coherent dis disciplinary knowledge and conceptual knowledge together. And we're able to do this because we've very clearly mapped how that disciplinary knowledge progresses. So throughout SNAP, we've been really clear, we've taken the national curriculum, the English national curriculum, and used that to develop a progression framework for working scientifically or disciplinary knowledge and whether or not you're using the English national curriculum it will you will still be able to use this this framework you'll see on the slide there that I've we've highlighted some words in blue this is a feature of snap second edition where there are specific words that it's important for children to learn and understand and here these are working scientifically words, then we highlight them in blue to make sure that teachers do really explicitly teach them. And we've done the same for the conceptual knowledge as well. We've also identified in lessons the um, what we've called the tier two language. So specific words, and this might particularly be useful with children in your classes who where English isn't their first language. So there's sort of key words that will be important for them to access the lesson but may not be, we need to teach explicitly, but you need to check they, well, they've understood them. So words like um, support or protect, things like that. I've just been uh, editing, left in my head, I've just been editing a section about the skeleton. So words like that, that we might use as teachers and assume our children understand, and we need to make sure that they do. The fourth um, uh, idea that, or issue that we are, were very clear to address is around assessment. If you've used SNAP before, you know that we were very clear always in SNAP that assessment is embedded in teaching and learning. So we are very clear in our learning intentions, what children will learn, what the outcome will be, what will ex how they will represent or express that learning. We expect, we, 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 we scaffold so that the teaching can be responsive, so that through teachers' questions, through, um, uh, through the activities they provide for children to do. We provide additional activities. If you get to the end of a, a module and you're not sure if a child's really got something or the end of a, a series of lessons where you've taught this particular idea, we provide a snapshot, which is an additional activity for you to, for you to use with a group of children. And we also require, we give, we give lots of um, guidance about how those summative judgments can be made across a range of evidence. So it looks a bit like this. This is the English national curriculum. There's a statement that says in year four that children need to recognize that living things can be grouped in a variety of ways. For this lesson I'm about to show you, we've also identified that in that lesson, we want children to learn how to identify differences and similarities related to simple scientific ideas and processes. You'll see there that in all changes is in brackets because they're not gonna learn that part of that statement in that lesson. So that means that the top of the lesson looks like this, a really, really clear uh, uh, explanation of what children will learn and do. And you'll see that those first three statements are about stuff they've learned previously. So they've learned about vertebrate, um, uh, the vertebrate groups, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, fish in year one and two. They've learned that plants can be grouped as deciduous and evergreen wild and garden plants. They learnt how plants grow from seeds and bulbs. So you need to revisit that. So we're making that clear to you. That's what they're building on. Then in this lesson, they're going to learn that one of the big ideas in science, a massive idea, is that living things can be classified. And in this lesson, we're going to do it as classified as either plants or animals. They're going to group them into those vertebrate and invertebrate groups. And for plants, as flowering and non-flowering. And they're going to do this based on common observable characteristics, things that can be observed in the classroom. All of that enabled them to answer the lesson question, how are living things classified? So we've been really clear there 
on what it is the children are going to learn in that lesson. And of course, the lesson requires them to do quite a lot of observing common observable features of a range of, of, um, of organisms. And um, obviously, as much as possible, in we want children to be using real things, but in, we have also, when we know that's not always uh, possible, we've got a lot of um, really high quality images for children to use, and these have been selected really carefully. And this set of plant and animal cards will be used then throughout the next few lessons to make sure that um, children are really coming to know this. They will revisit this and revisit them and sort them in different ways. And then at the end of that first lesson, the one I just described to you, we provide guidance for teachers. Can the children identify the similarities and differences between the observable characteristics of a range of animals that we've given you? Can they recognize whether they're animals or plants? Can they state that plants are either flowering or non-flowering and name two examples? And can they state that animals are either vertebrates or invertebrates and name at least two examples? Note that we've indicated there also what we don't expect them to be able to do. So we're giving you a sort of conceptual boundary there. This is what we want everybody to be able to do. And that's what the lesson is designed to do. And that's what you are looking for um, throughout the lesson and at the end. And then that means that making those uh, recording those assessment judgments is quite straightforward and we've given you a very straightforward tracker which is an excel document so that it can be integrated into other recording you may have in school and you'll see here this is a year one one where i've listed the different statements from the english national curriculum the lessons they'll be taught in and then when you get when you've taught those lessons so you can see uh, module three they're naming and describing materials that is taught in um, distinguishing an object from the material which is made is taught in lesson five there and it's taught in lesson one of the next module. So by the time you've taught lesson one of the next module, you should be able to make a judgment about that one. And then you can record that on the, on the spreadsheet. So we're giving you really clear um, indications about how to make those assessment judgments. Evidence-informed pedagogy, this was another issue that has been evidenced from the research that's gone on in the last um, in the in the last year or so. So about how we select the pedagogical approaches we use. And I think this is this is tough. You know, learning should develop from children's needs, their previous learning, their context, and the concepts being taught. So that requires us as teachers to know which is the best way to teach this, this part of the science knowledge or this scientific skill. And so that requires teachers to have access to information, guidance and training about a range of appropriate teaching approaches. This is lifted from the Ofsted report. Now that's tough, you know, that's a big ask. And that's why within SNAP, we are here to support you to do that. Because we want um, you to have access to the very best practice so that you know which is what is the best way to teach this particular topic or idea. So within SNAP, we've brought in a wide repertoire of effective and tested teaching approaches. We've included practical work, teacher demonstration, direct teaching, inquiry-based learning, vocabulary development, modeling, drama, outdoor learning, dialogic teaching. They're all there, plus, 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 lots more. Because we, we've had time and, it, and I've got some expert authors to think about the best way to teach this. We provide really clear guidance to, to help you identify hazards and make sure that your class is a safe place. And we also have been absolutely clear about making sure that the approaches we are using are equitable, that every child can access this. We know that children bring a huge range of experiences to your science lessons. And we want all children to feel that they are asset rich, that they all have something worthwhile to contribute. So we're not making judgments about, the, you know, about the sort of people who do science. Science is for everyone. We all need to be scientifically literate. We all need to, to you know, be part of this world as, as global citizens. So we need that scientific knowledge. So we want to make sure that all children, whatever their background or prior knowledge, can access and enjoy the learning. We've been absolutely explicit about this throughout SNAP, testing every lesson to make sure every child 
can benefit from it and can bring things to it. So, um, and so that's on a sort of, on, on a level of making sure that we don't say things like, look in your garden at home, because not every child will have a garden, but they all should be able to find somewhere where they can engage with the living world. So um, that's what we want to make sure that we're not saying things that actually disenfranchise some children. So evidence-informed pedagogy, I've got an example here. This is a lesson that actually was in Old Snap that was in uh, the previous version. And this is that part of the English national curriculum where children are identifying what makes fish different from other vertebrates. So how they're different from mammals, how they're different from birds, how they're different from reptiles and amphibians. And we, um, for this lesson, you could teach it through pictures and you could teach it through video, but we are absolutely clear that the best way to teach this is to get children engaging and touching some fish. So that's what we do in the lesson. So you'll see here, this lesson requires children to think a bit more about what they know about the five vertebrate groups, and then to learn the things that make a fish distinct. And we've listed them there, and they do that by observing fish closely. And then we have a question we want them to answer, we want them to find out if fish have fingers. So we give clear, guidance here about how to do this, where you, what the fish you should use and how to manage this safely in your classroom. And the reason I want to show you this is because when the pedagogy is right, when we've really thought about the best way of teaching this, then the impact is, is quite significant. So this is a picture here that was done in a classroom where the teacher used uh, used lovely pictures and had children looking at videos of fish moving and then um, did the lesson again the following year, a new group of children and had uh, fish in the classroom and went to the fishmonger and brought some, some fish back for the children to handle. And this was the picture, that the, the type of pictures that children were, were drawing. And I think you can see there how children's observational skills have improved and their knowledge of what fish are like through that first-hand experience. So that's a pedagogical approach that we have said is the best way to teach that bit of the curriculum. But for other things, it might be something like here, that sort of, uh, that sort of discussion around um, like a concept cartoon type approach where you're saying, do you agree or disagree? And getting children to think about the evidence that they might use to say why they agree or disagree with this or what they might do to find out which statement is correct. Then um, we've, we've used card sorts, there's some here, uh, we've used um, sequencing, we've used uh, drama approaches, there's an awful lot of practical work where children are actually carrying out experiments, there's experiments or investigations that take part that are uh, where observing over time, where they need to carry out and revisit their observations between lessons, so we provide really clear guidance about you know, how you set that up so that you so that they, they can make those observations over time. So there's, an, there's a huge range um, of, uh, of learning approaches in SNAP. And having, I promise you, I've been through every lesson really carefully and the range is really exciting and really positive. And I think we'll really, um, we'll really inspire not just the children, which of course is the main, uh, main intention, but will inspire you. And I've always felt really passionate about the fact that if this is if this is a good resource it's cpd on a page it will it will enable you to build your your repertoire as a teacher and the reason it'll do that is because it's written by some really good people so the pictures here um, represent eight of the very best people in primary working in primary science in the uk at the moment they're all highly respected educators lecturers, designer, curriculum designers, consultants, authors, and they have put their heart and soul into this and um, have written a really fantastic resource for you to use. I couldn't be more proud of them and of the work that they've produced. So, you know, it wouldn't it be lovely if we could all have an expert in our classroom with us all day, every day. We can't, but I can give you these people in your classroom who have working alongside you when you're using the SNAP resource. So to summarise, if I was to really think about what are the, the key things that, in, um, that, make, that we've built into SNAP, 
it's that planning for learning, breaking the learning down into clear steps, focusing on the learning, not the activity, making the knowledge that's going to be learned really clear and the steps for learning that. We're looking about accessibility, making sure that every single child can access the learning with adaptations for support as needed and also additional challenge. We've been really explicit about the teaching of vocabulary. The progression is so clearly mapped. What children have previously learned, what they're going to learn, this prepares children to learn this, and that working scientifically progression is really clear. Building children's science capital, highlighting what children may or may or bring, may or may not bring with them, and building their own sort of backpack of understanding about science, not just the stuff they know, but the values they learn, the attitudes they build, the experiences they have. And then finally, assessment, building that right the way through and giving you as the teacher, we know how important assessment is, giving you really clear guidance so that you can use assessment, not just of learning, but assessment really does become assessment for learning. So, it always feels slightly weird talking about this because this is something that I've done and I care very much about, but there are some really key benefits to SNAP. There's an expert author team. They really are experts and they've written really good stuff. We've already proven that we work and now we've made it even better. There's robust progression. It's carefully sequenced. The planning is long-term coherent planning. The pedagogy is evidence-informed. What I didn't mention earlier is for every part of um, all of the, uh, the approaches to, to teaching that we've um, built into SNAP, We've written short briefings that are there for you as the subject leader to read, uh, to sort of really inform yourself about why we've done it like this. And also shorter versions of those as PowerPoints for you to use in, in staff rooms if you want. There's a huge amount of support material on there for subject leaders. So there's lots and lots of guidance about planning. There's guidance about teaching. There's guidance about assessment. But there's also shorter versions of that so that you can enable your, for, for your teachers to use in staff meetings. Purposeful, high quality practical science. Purposeful is absolutely key. This is children doing practical work to get better at doing science and to learn more science. We've got really fantastic subject knowledge in each module introduction, which you must read before you start teaching. We've, as well as all the sort of summarizing what children will learn and do, we've given you the absolute sort of what you need to know, your subject knowledge. You can't be experts in all in everything. Your job's too big for that. So we've provided you that uh, uh, the key subject knowledge there, written really clearly and uh, really, I think, in a really interesting way. And all of this is accessed by a digital subscription. So you pay your subscription, and then everybody in your school can access it, download everything they need for every lesson, as well as the lessons. There's a whole heap of resources. There's videos. There's um. There's, there's just masses of stuff to go with it. So we've done a lot of the work for you, but we also, um, all those lessons are Word documents. The important thing is that you make it your own, you adapt it, you use it, you evaluate how it's going. 